we're, we're dealing with U.S.-European relations. Um, and the number of topics which are of interest within that rubric are, are endless. And the number of things which are of great interest to our country are numerous, so much so that they, they seem perhaps overwhelming, except that this evening we're fortunate to be joined uh, by the gentleman who uh, is given responsibility by the U.S. Department of State for that region of the world. And uh, he assigns priorities to these things, spends his life thinking about them, and uh, will benefit from uh, the fruits of those labors uh, this evening. Ambassador Grossman uh, received his Bachelor of Art degree, Arts degrees from uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, his Master of Science in International Relations from the London School of Economics and uh, Political Science. He joined the State Department as a career Foreign Service officer in 1976, uh, was assigned uh, uh, as a political officer to the NATO mission, U.S. mission uh, to NATO, uh, political officer to, in uh, Islamabad. He uh, was a special assistant, a deputy special assistant to Jimmy Carter, and uh, during those early years also had a couple of tours at the Bureau of Near Eastern and South Asian Affairs. From 84 to 86, he was a, a deputy director of the private office of Lord Harrington, who was then Secretary General of, of NATO. And in following years was a, uh, an assistant to uh, uh, John Whitehead, who was the Deputy Secretary of State. Then he himself served as, as uh, principal Deputy Secretary of State for political and military affairs. Uh, he later served as uh, a uh, special assistant to Secretary of State Christopher and uh, then as uh, our ambassador to Turkey from 1994 to 97 before in late uh, summer 1997 being approved to his present position as Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs. Great expectations for a wonderful evening. It's my great pleasure to present Ambassador Mark Grossman. Thanks a lot. Mr. Bird, thank you very much. Well, I hope from that biography you won't conclude that I can't keep a job. But, uh, <laughs> listen, I wanted to apologize, first of all. Um, I think it's quite a remarkable scene where you all are looking at me, and I actually have the great good fortune of looking out on certainly one of the most beautiful views I've ever given a speech to. So if I look a little bit above, uh, I hope that you'll forgive me. I spend most of my time in Baltimore there in Camden Yards, and um, so this is a wonderful, wonderful way to take a look at it. Mr. Bird, I wanted to join you in thanking all of the people who, first of all, came out here tonight to listen, I hope, to what will be a good talk on U.S.-European relations and certainly to thank all those sponsors. You were right to say, of course, that it's an overwhelming agenda. I hope that at the end of this you won't consider that I've been overwhelmed. Um, we try our very best to make sure that our purpose each day is to make sure that the United States of America is protected and, it's pr and the United States of America's interests are pursued very actively and with as much vigor as we can all over Europe. And I hope at the end of my short presentation, uh, you'll believe that, that I can convince you that that is true, uh, and then we can have any kind of discussion that you would all like about United States-European relations. What I'd like to do, actually, if you would, wouldn't mind for a few minutes, is just talk to you about this relationship between the United States and Europe, and I think for me anyway, very importantly, to talk about the future of the relationship between the United States and Europe. And I'd give you three questions, if I could, to start this discussion off. Question number one, does Europe still matter to the United States? Question number two, what kind of relationship does the United States want to build with Europe in the future? And third, very important for me, for what purpose? Why have this relationship with Europe? What good is it for Europeans and what good is it for Americans? It strikes me that in many ways, this is a very, very good time to assess where we stand in our relationship with Europe and where we're headed. And the reason I say that is that last fall, 
we mark the 10th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War. Since 1989, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the central organization in this relationship between the United States and Europe, has enlarged, enlarged to Central Europe, adopted a new strategic concept, and of course, one year ago exactly, NATO was in action to stop Milosevic's aggression in Kosovo. But very importantly, I think as well, Europe is now a global economic superpower. I'll just give you some statistics here to show you what the magnitude of this relationship is. The United States and the European Union share the biggest trade and investment relationship in the world, currently worth more than $1.2 trillion. The United States exports $334 billion a year to the European Union, and they export about $363 billion dollars a year worth of goods to the United States. Almost a quarter of all American exports go to Europe. Half, half of all the goods and services produced in the world are produced between the United States and the European Union. An estimated 6.5 million U.S. jobs are supported by European investments in the United States and another one and a half million jobs depend upon U.S. exports to Europe. One in every 12 U.S. factory workers is employed in one of 4,000 European-owned businesses in the United States, and the numbers are similar in Europe. 63% of all foreign investment into the EU states comes from the United States, and Europeans account for 56% of all foreign investment into the United States. And here's a statistic I love. European companies are the number one international investor in 41 United States states and are number two in eight of the nine other states. So this is a massive relationship based upon economics and based upon trade. Now Maryland is a very, very important part of this trend toward transatlantic prosperity because international trade is one of the fastest growing sectors of Maryland's economy accounting for nearly $6 billion in sales last year and supporting 110,000 jobs. The United Kingdom, Germany, and Belgium are among Maryland's top export markets. The United Kingdom, France, and Germany are the first, fourth, and fifth largest investors in Maryland. Now, of course, here we look out on the port of Baltimore, which, of course, has been crucial to U.S.-European trade since it was founded in 1706. But Maryland has worked very, very hard in those years to keep its international economic edge. And right now, 300 biotechnology companies are based in Maryland. And I read the other day that that number went up by one last month with the decision by a Dutch company called Kiagen, one of the top biotech companies in Europe, to build its North American headquarters in Maryland. And it was interesting to me that the company leadership credited the excellent cooperation and support they'd received from state, county, and local governments with their decision to make their investment here. And Governor Glenn Denning and others involved in it showed them and showed others the real understanding of globalization and this relationship between Europe and the United States. I might say also, since we work so closely with them, that on the national stage as well, both of Maryland's senators have contributed greatly to this U U.S. European relationship. As many of you know, Senator Mikulski was a leader in the fight to expand NATO in 1998. And one of my great memories was the scene in Independence, Missouri, the hometown of Harry S. Truman, where Senator Mikulski joined with Secretary Albright to welcome Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic into NATO. And so when I work particularly closely with Senator Sarbanes has been a strong supporter of Better Ties with Europe through his service on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and an important voice in subcommittees on European affairs, international economic policy, trade, and export promotion. Now, these are some of the examples, as I see them, of what the United States and Europe are doing together economically today and what impact that has on Maryland and what impact Maryland has on that relationship. What I'd like to do now is talk for a moment about how this relationship with Europe works as a whole. And then if you'll allow me at the very end, I'd like to make a pitch for the State Department. <laughs> My proposition is a pretty simple one. 
My proposition is, is that Europe matters as much to the United States today as it did during the Cold War. And here are the three reasons that I'd give you. First, as Secretary Albright, I think very rightly says, it has to be that the great lesson of this last century is that the destinies of North America and Europe are joined. Second, thank you. second, our work in Europe is not complete because the old lines of division have to give way to new connections of cooperation, and that must very much include Russia. And third, very important as well, in my view anyway, there are still some real threats to this transatlantic community. Now, no power today threatens Europe, and that's a very good thing, and we ought to keep it that way. But ethnic cleansing, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, refugees, terrorist violence, all pose threats to Europe's stability and therefore to the interests of the United States. And when I talk about this, I say that our goal in the future should be that we ought to be as effective in dealing with these new threats as we were effective in dealing with the old ones. Because for decades, the United States concentrated on what it could do for Europe. But I think the future is going to be about what we can do with Europe. We have possibilities when we work with Europeans that we have no place else. So what kind of relationship is it that the United States should have with Europe? The way I talk about this is that we want a relationship with Europe that's a partnership, which reflects American interests and American values and promotes the common interests between Americans and Europeans. Let me give you some ways that you might identify whether this relationship exists and how we're promoting it in the future. Here's what this 21st century relationship would look like. First, it's a relationship with Europe as a whole and not just with its Western half. Second, it's a relationship in which defense and security are vital, but economic security and managing global threats will command ever more attention. Third, it's a relationship that takes as a mission conflict prevention, crisis management, and heading off problems before they start. Next, it's a relationship where the United States and Europe share risks and burdens but also the responsibility to find common solutions to threats and crises beyond Europe. And finally, it's a relationship that builds on the fact of a new global economy. Now, to make these five indicators real, to make them happen, we needed a plan for this new partnership. And so two years ago, in a speech in Berlin, President Clinton outlined the three central themes of our relationship with Europe. First, security. Second, prosperity. And third, democracy. Now, he didn't talk in Berlin about what we could do for Europe. He talked in Berlin about what we could do with Europe. And so Secretary Albright and I took this speech not only as good guidance from the President of the United States and a blueprint, but as a challenge. And following the President's lead, we've pursued a plan to modernize, to adapt, and to expand the core institutions of this partnership across the Atlantic. I'll give you a short report on what I think happened in 1999 to pursue those goals. First and very much foremost in my mind, we adapted NATO to the 21st century. A year ago, actually a year ago exactly, NATO leaders gathered in Washington to observe the 50th anniversary of our alliance and, as I said, welcomed Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic as new members bolstering partnerships and preparing, and, and preparing against new threats. Very importantly also, we kept the door open to further NATO enlargement. And we declared our support for a European security and defense identity that strengthens the transatlantic relationship and allows for balancing, sharing of burdens and responsibilities. We also in 1999 took a very important step at the end of the Kosovo bombing because we joined with the European Union to launch what is called the Stability Pact for Southeastern Europe, where we're working with countries of the region to break the cycle of conflict there and support them as they transform their economic, social, and political systems. In June of 1999, in Bonn, the United States and the European Union signed a declaration designed to advance that $1.2 trillion trading relationship I was talking about 
to act together in fast-breaking crises, to manage our differences, and to address global challenges. And in November of last year, in Istanbul, we signed a new charter for European security with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, recognizing that in the future, stability within societies is certainly going to be as important as stability between states. Now, we accomplished all of these tasks as we pursued our objectives in Kosovo. Kosovo was certainly a great test of our commitment to our alliance and to its ideals. It was a challenge to these principles of security and prosperity and democracy, not a challenge in theory, but a challenge in practice. And I'm proud to say, for me anyway, that through determination and unity, I think we did what was right and we prevailed. And so many people said that we could not pursue our objectives in Kosovo and also pursue our other objectives in Europe to transform and adapt this alliance. And I think that's not right. Obviously, now we face the next few years, and the question is, so what's the challenge? How do we move forward? How do we take this plan for the right and new kind of relationship between the United States and Europe and create it for the 21st century? Let me give you four or five ideas. First and foremost, we need to work in Europe's southeast corner. Our immediate challenge, obviously, is to bring and help build democracy there, which, got, which has to be the key to our strategy in the region. And for us, it's a fairly simple proposition. Democratic governments are more likely to encourage ethnic tolerance. They're more stable, more interested in establishing closer economic and political ties with the West. Now, one of the good things that's happening in Southeastern Europe is that Europe and the European Union is leading the partnership to reconstruct Kosovo. Because we've talked a lot about rebalancing this partnership between the United States and Europe. Europe and Canada have 82% of the troops in Kosovo. Europe has contributed 60% of the money this year for Kosovo, and our contribution is 13% of the total. Now, we welcome this partnership because it's exactly the kind of rebalancing that we believe is in everybody's interests, so that the United States is not forced to constantly carry the largest part of this burden. As I say, a big part of what the European Union is doing is this commitment that they've made to Kosovo and to the Stability Pact. And indeed, last week, on March the 30th in Brussels, we agreed with our European partners to launch $2.3 billion of what we're calling quick start programs to get these countries back on their feet, to focus in on transportation, on water, energy infrastructure, reopen borders, and disarm militias. Out of the $2.3 billion that was pledged on the 30th of March in Brussels, the United States share is 77.6 million, about 3.2%. And we're proud of that accomplishment, not only that we created this program, but that the burden is properly shared. Now, it's obvious, and it's right, and we have to say that the transformation of Southeastern Europe will be very, very difficult. Open democracies, integrated democracies, built on the rule of law, don't occur overnight. And the key here is that the international community keep its commitments. And of course, the people of the region need to keep their commitment to positive change. Another major challenge in the years ahead will be our relations with Russia. And here, we want to engage with the Russians. We've got to continue to engage with the Russians through NATO's Permanent Joint Council where we can discuss security issues with them. Keep working with the Russians in the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE. We can work with Moscow through the Group of Eight, the Organization of the World's Important Industrialized Countries. We should work with Russia in the United Nations. We should press Russia for a political, not a military solution to conflicts within its borders. And we've got, in, we've got to keep helping Russia stabilize its economy and its democracy. Now, last month, Russia had its second presidential election in nine years. And as Secretary Albright said, when that election was over, we will and we must work with Pre President-elect Putin. And we'll see now if he follows through on his statements about the need for economic reform, protection of the rule of law, and respect for the rights of all citizens. In these next two or three years, there's also a tremendous amount of work yet to do at NATO. This is the year, the year 2000 
that we can get the European security and defense identity, which we very strongly support, get it right. ESDI is the way for Europeans to take more responsibility for their own defense. And I believe that a stronger European military contribution will make our NATO alliance stronger, lift some of the burden off the United States to act in all crises, and make this US-European partnership I've been talking about more balanced and more successful. We also need to make sure that NATO is ready for the full range of the missions that are coming in this century, and we need to keep NATO's door open to new members. Also high on my agenda is the need to continue to make progress in the Aegean. And here is something where Senator Sarbanes and I have worked very closely together. Greece and Turkey are developing closer ties, but much more can be done, and we need to move toward a comprehensive settlement on Cyprus. In this trade relationship with the European Union, we need to better manage what business people, interestingly, on both sides of the Atlantic, are calling the brink of trade war syndrome. We think it shouldn't take the pressure of a crisis to bring us to an agreement on critical trade issues. We need to pursue the early warning and problem-solving principles that we agreed with the United States and the Europeans last June. And finally, and I don't know any other way to say this, I think we need to find ways to take this relationship between the United States and Europe to the next level, where the United States and Europe can start to work on issues outside of Europe. North Korea, drug smuggling, trafficking in women and children, managing crises and political instability in Indonesia, or helping with the floods in Mozambique. These seem to me part and parcel of the challenges of the new century and something that the United States and Europe ought to be doing together. I promised you a short pitch about the State Department. I hope that you are proud of what we do to promote America's interests in Europe. Because it's in America's interest to work as a partner with allies and friends around the world. But it's obvious that we can't do this without resources. And the question is whether we'll have the resources to provide international leadership that Americans deserve and our interests demand. One of the most interesting questions that I have often talked to groups is sort of what percentage of our total federal budget goes to international affairs? And you'd be astonished at what people tell you. 50 cents, 30 cents, 40 cents, a nickel. A penny of every federal budget dollar goes for international affairs, and that's all in. That's the State Department, foreign aid, the whole deal. That money can make the difference between hardship and prosperity for our citizens, war and peace for our country, oppression and freedom for our world. As Secretary Albright says, international diplomacy and programs constitute America's first line of defense against threats to security and prosperity for the United States. Unfortunately, over these years, our diplomatic resources, I don't think, have kept pace at all with our responsibility. My own view is that America cannot lead without these resources. American diplomacy belongs on the short list of our budget priorities, and I hope that you will support a diplomacy for the 21st century. Thank you very much. I, I can't thank you for a pitch for the State Department, I suppose, but I, I do thank you for what I think was a, a marvelous overview and, and, and uh, the presentation of your, your central themes. The floor is now open for questions. Would you talk about European negative feelings toward the United States? Sure, I will. Um, those of you who read that article in the, in the New York Times, I think it was well worth reading because there's no doubt that in Europe there's a considerable amount of anxiety about the United States. The United States is too big. The United States is too powerful. The United States has too many internet connections. The United States produces too many jobs. Um, the United States does too much around the world. And that, that feeling exists. And I think we have to deal with it in some way. And the way it comes out in, 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 in some countries, and I think especially in France, is that America is some kind of hegemonic power. And uh, I actually, um, when I am arguing with Europeans about this, like to turn that question around, which is to say, really, of all of these things, which is it that you wouldn't want us to do? You know, would you like us not to create jobs, take in all these exports, do all this business on the internet, uh, defend as we have over the years the NATO alliance? I think it's a very important thing. But you need to actually understand, and we need to understand that there are these anxieties in the world. And I think the way that the United States talks about itself and puts itself 
in front of other people is extremely important. Now, the other thing that's important about that New York Times article is the other thing you have to admit, of course, is that we're not a perfect country. And yes, we have tremendous problems with race. And yes, we have tremendous problems with violence. And yes, we have tremendous problems. But the great thing about the United States is those problems are by and large out in the open and people are trying to solve them. And so I don't really feel any great guilt over this. But it is a problem and we've got to deal with it. I'll make one other point. Part of the challenge here, it of course, comes from Kosovo. And one of the reasons that in my talk I, I emphasize so much the importance of Europeans doing more for themselves is, of course, it was hard for Europeans to see the United States fly 75% percent of the missions in Kosovo. Uh, as Tony Blair said uh, in, in, in a number of interviews, you know, the Europeans spend a huge amount of money on defense, but don't have the flexibility and the capacity that we do. And that's got to change. And that's why we're supporters of the European Union taking responsibility in Kosovo on the economic side, and why we are also supporters of this European security and defense identity. My own view, sir, is, is that as Europeans become more confident, they will worry less about us. And uh, that's my goal, and I, I hope that turns out to be right. Would you uh, define the, the uh, parameters of Southeast Europe and uh, talk about the possibility of some of these states joining NATO? Yeah. Um, well, for me, Southeastern Europe is that whole area that's the Balkans, uh, the, the Balkans, uh, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, what I would consider the whole part of Europe that has not had the kind of transformation that has happened in the central part of Europe and going, is going on now in the northern part of Europe. Um, and that's why we're focused so hard on this. And if I could give you my vision eight or nine years out, we would take the philosophy that we have used and all of you have used so successfully these past number of years with our success in Central Europe and apply it first to, North, to Northern Europe. And I think in Northern Europe, between the Baltic states, the, the Nordic states, and what's going on in Northwestern Russia, people are starting to understand that there's a zone there that's win-win. That they don't have to keep fighting one another up there, and that's a good thing. But we'd like to take that philosophy and apply it to Southeastern Europe as well, so that someday, if we really believe in a Europe whole and free, you'll have a Europe whole and free in the North. Europe, Poland, free in the south, and that will extend then down into southeastern Europe, the Balkan states, Bulgaria, Romania. It'll extend also, as I said in my presentation, to the eastern Mediterranean, Greece and Turkey and Cyprus. And then we really will have a Europe whole and free. Now, in terms of these countries joining NATO, uh, a lot of this responsibility, I'd say the majority of the responsibility is to them. Um, NATO's not a country club, as sort of Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic found out, because they came into NATO, and 12 days later, they were in action in Kosovo. And it's very important for Americans, I think, to understand that when a country joins NATO, you're giving these people what we know as Article 5 guarantees, the most solemn guarantees that one country can give to another, which is we will fight for you if you get in trouble. So we've set standards and we've set requirements for countries to join NATO. They've got to have the right kind of military. They've got to be able to be producers of security and not just consumers of security. In April of last year at the NATO summit, we said that all those countries in Southeastern Europe and the three Baltic states, um, we recognized that they wanted to be members of NATO. We said that we would review where they all stood in the year 2002. But very importantly, we didn't just put it out there and said, we'll come back to this in 2002. We also established what's called the Membership Action Plan and Membership Action Programs so that every single one of the nine countries that's interested in joining NATO is now on a plan to reform its military, spend more money on defense, or spend money on defense differently to come up to certain NATO standards. And we'll see where they are in 2002. But right now, that responsibility belongs on the, the nations. One more point, so I'm just absolutely clear. The United States believes in the open door. I think one of the key parts of our foreign policy toward NATO now is, is that the door to NATO membership has to stay open, and that the first three that we brought in last year are not the last. How would you deal with the question of immigration in Europe? L well, let me give you two answers to that. <laughs> He's good. He's very good. <laughs> um, l let me try to give you two answers to your question. Uh, first answer is that I think it's very important for European countries, just as it is for the United States of America, to recognize that we live now in a multi-ethnic world, and that isn't going to go away. And for a country like Germany, for example, or other countries, uh, where large number of immigrants came in over the many years, uh, that it's time now for those countries to deal with these people in a humane and civilized manner. And I think if you look at what's happening in Germany, 
Um, people are trying to come to grips with this, and, and I think it's a very good thing. Europe is a multi-ethnic, uh, it's, a, it's a melange. I mean, it's always been, but now it's a, much, it's a much greater one. And We don't do this perfectly, they don't do this perfectly, but it's very important, I believe, that Europeans put this on the agenda. The second question you said is, would you spend money uh, in countries where people might come from? Well, I guess, ma'am, from my view anyway, it's not just a matter of money. It's a matter of integrating these societies into what is more and more of a globalized economy. I mean, I was the ambassador to Turkey. What were the reasons that we were so interested in making sure that Turkey became a candidate to be part of the European Union? Because we wanted more democracy in Turkey. We wanted more human rights in Turkey. We wanted more economic development in Turkey. And you know, I didn't spend a dime of the taxpayers' money while I was in Turkey on aid. What I did was I tried to get American companies to come and invest in Turkey. Now, was part of my reason to keep Turks at home? Maybe, but it wasn't high on my list. What I was trying to do was make that society a modern society, a progressive society, where people would have an investment there. And if a corollary advantage is that people then didn't migrate so much, maybe that's all right. Now, in other parts of our foreign policy, Maybe, maybe it's more explicit and people should, you know, maybe, this, maybe that's a more explicit part. But our, our European policy is make societies modern, have people be successful, and it isn't just a matter of money, it's a matter of democracy and human rights and development and being part of the modern world. Would you uh, include Russia and NATO, and if not, uh, how do you keep them from seeing this as a threat? Well, I, I actually think that Russia shouldn't see NATO expansion as a threat at all, because it's not. Uh, I don't see how, uh, I, I, I mean, I'm not a Russian, so you'd have to ask them. But from my perspective, well, but, would we ah, that? but you see, we the, get kind of upset about little Cuba. Well, but you see, but that, that assumes, it assumes with respect that the, that the purpose of NATO is aimed at somebody. The purpose of NATO is to protect the countries that are members of NATO. And one of the great things about it for the last 50 or 55 years is that what it has done is absolutely what it was supposed to have done, prevent conflict in Europe. And the one place where this broke down was by a person who didn't believe in deterrence, Slobodan Milosevic, and a person who was with all the, you know, the way I looked at it anyway, was putting people in railway cars in Europe in 1999. Unacceptable. So NATO acted. I don't think that's Russia's problem at all. And so I hope that over time, uh, Russians will recognize that NATO is not a threat to it. Now, your real, the question is, would you have Russia and NATO? I, I don't mean to be flip, but I mean, I guess if it ever came to that, I think it'd be a very different Russia. Uh, it'd certainly be a very different NATO. Um, but in my, in my presentation, what I said was, a goal of all of us has to be to transform the old lines of division into lines of cooperation, which would include Russia. And when you think what we're doing with Russia, what the European Union and Europeans are doing with Russia, uh, I hope more and more they can understand that and believe that. What uh, is U.S. policy uh, toward Montenegro and in Montenegro? I say, I, you've asked a very good question, and Montenegro is something that we spend a tremendous amount of time paying attention to. Um, and you've hit all the right points. We'd like Montenegro to be part of the democratic development of the former Republic of Yugoslavia. We'd like Montenegro to not be threatened by other parts, uh, by Belgrade. Uh, we'd like Montenegro to have the kind of connections with the West that people there seek. But you're absolutely right to say that we are not in favor of an independent Montenegro in the same way that we're not in favor of an independent Kosovo. Uh, we think that the answer to these questions lies in democracy in Belgrade. And one of the most interesting parts of our policy right now is we're focused on Montenegro and we give, a lot, we give aid to Montenegro, we do a lot of support for Montenegro, and we've talked very clearly to people about not threatening Montenegro doing the same thing in Kosovo, but really what this is about is democracy in Belgrade, because that area won't change uh, until Mr. Milosevic is gone, or there's a big change in his attitude and he becomes much, much more democratic. And it goes back, sir, to your question, which is how do you deal with Southeastern Europe? You know, Southeastern Europe is never really going to be a success unless the Serbian people are part of it. I mean, how can you really have a stability pact that promotes democracy and tolerance and economic development over the years and Serbs aren't part of it? How can you really have uh, a Europe whole and free with no Serbs? So we've got to keep focused absolutely on Montenegro, Kosovo as well, but democracy in Serbia every day. Should, uh, is multiculturalism uh, the answer or territorial division? Our, our goal is a multi-ethnic state, just like our goal is that in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And when you think back to Dayton, everybody said, not possible isn't going to happen. 
But if you look at the election results on Sunday and Monday in Bosnia-Herzegovina, actually I think we started to take some steps in that direction. Now, will this happen in Kosovo? I don't know the answer to your question. What I'm sure though, sir, is it's too early to give up. And I say that for a couple of reasons. One is, is that I think as a multi-ethnic state, one of our goals in this world ought to be to show people that if you want this to happen, it can happen. And secondly, and this is kind of a philosophical point, and everybody has to come to this in their own way, I actually don't think that there are people who are just condemned by their religion or their race or where they live to always fighting with one another. I mean, I, I think that's too easy an answer to say, oh, well, it isn't worth it. They'll always fight. I think is a condescending and wrong way to look at this. Now, over a period of 30 or 40 years, I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know that in my view, it's too soon to give up. I mean, look at what we accomplished in 50 years in Central Europe. I mean, who'd have thought in 1946 that in 1998 and 1999, Poland, the Hungary, and the Czech Republic would be members of NATO? Nobody. I don't think anybody would have thought that in 1995. But we persevered, we stuck with it, we had objectives, we kept with it, we didn't write them off and say that they could never become anything than what they are, and we did something different there. So I think we have higher purposes here. And I can't tell you how it'll all come out. I can tell you that in my view, it's too soon to give up. Is NATO's name no longer correct? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose that off a hundred things I had to do each day, one of the things we could do would be to try to change NATO's name. But I, I, I'd actually just give it a rest because it's, 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 when you say NATO, everybody understands what you're talking about. And, because they don't know a name geography. Well, but you, but you see, sir, no, but I, no, I want to come directly to your point. It's no longer only about geography. I mean, if this was only about geography, we would be the kind of country that was sort of only doing realpolitik, the only, only country that didn't believe in anything. Because what the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is about is about a transatlantic relationship that's based on values. And, and I have to say, I've been in this job now three years, and when I started, values, values, sure, let's get on with the important things. I have to say that the more I'm in this job, the more important these values of democracy, human rights, free markets, and individuals are. And so, sure, Hungary doesn't border, <laughs> Hungary, Hungary doesn't border the North Atlantic. Got it. But, Hungary is, in my view anyway, part of this transatlantic conversation, which is about values. And that's a very important thing to them, and it ought to be a very important thing to the United States. The observation was that uh, Russians are now uneasy with Americans. Should we perhaps emphasize their, uh, their attachments to Europe? Well, I'd like to emphasize their attachments to Europe, and I hope the European Union will take a leadership role in making this connection. Russia's a European country. And those ought to be connections that are natural and, 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 and right for the European Union to make. I think, though, it is our responsibility in all of this uh, to do more with, sort of maybe directly with, the Russian people. I mean, one of the interesting things over the past few years has been the shift in the kind of assistance that we've given to Russia. Seventy percent of our assistance now is given directly to non-governmental organizations, to entrepreneurs. Uh, we, keep, we don't give very much money or assistance now to the Russian government. And I think that's good. We ought to be focusing in on the important things about the future of Russia, like civil society. I mean, we, we all think of ourselves as great advocates of civil society. Well, of course, in Russia 10 years ago, five years ago, in your example, there were probably a handful of civil society organizations. Today, at best count, there are 65,000. I mean, in a country like ours, where the World Affairs Council, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, and the Red Cross are, are part of our daily lives, this is a revolution. And so, absolutely, European Union has a huge role in this, but we ought to play our part uh, in making sure that Russian people have a rule of law and a civic society that will ultimately, I hope, lessen this fear of the West and also make their own society that much stronger and self-confident. Is the State Department going to do anything about Chechnya? Well, we've actually tried to do a lot about Chechnya. Um, it has been a huge part of the conversation uh, between the President and uh, both uh, Mr. Yeltsin and now Mr. Putin. Uh, the Secretary of State has made it a very big part of her agenda uh, with uh, her counterpart, Foreign Minister Ivanov. When we were together with everybody at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe last November, uh, it, was a it was a very big part of the discussion and a very important statement was issued for OSCE. What we would like the Russians to do now are three or four things. One is, it's very important, it seems to us anyway, 
that international organizations like the Red Cross be allowed to go there and, and do their wonderful work. Second, we also think that the OSCE, this Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, that Russia is a part of, ought to re-engage its observer missions uh, in the area. Third, um, you know, we see some of these European institutions, as the gentleman uh, alluded to, the Council of Europe now being more involved in Chechnya, and we think that's good. Uh, and finally, um, it's our hope, it's our view, that Russians really need to now start to start talking to Chechens about the right kind of political solution in that area. So we've tried very hard to keep this on the agenda, to make sure that Russians know that the rest of the world is watching what they're doing, and try to offer the four or five sensible things that they might actually accomplish. How do you see the European Union <laughs> a century from now? A century from now. Um, A century seems like such a long time to answer this question. Um, but I, I, no, I, I'll give you the best answer I can. And, and I'll give you it in, in two alternatives. And, and I, I really shouldn't be talking about this. It's really for a European to talk about this, because the European Union is not a transatlantic institution. It's a, a European institution. It's their vision, their view of how they want to live. But let me give you two alternatives. A hundred years from now, I suppose it's possible that the European Union would be more like the structure in the United States, where there'd be a, f a federal system, and where the states that currently exist in Europe had federated in some way and had continued as they have over these past few years with the Euro, with the European Monetary Union, with ESDI, kind of ceding some of their sovereignty. I, I suppose that's a possibility, but you'd have to ask a European whether they think that's a good or a bad idea. The other possibility, though, and here I give a slight pitch for um, for borders and, and your 20% discount. If you, read, if you read Tom Friedman's book, the, the Lexus and the Olive Tree, it's also possible that what could happen in Europe would be that it would be a Europe of regions and that central governments in Europe might not actually have the kind of power that they do today and that uh, the triangles that are operating in Europe now, for example, between Milan and Geneva, um, you know, Milan, Geneva, and, uh, and, and in that region are, are going to be the most important parts of Europe. So you could either see kind of a more federal system, I suppose, or you could see a Europe of regions where people were developing for themselves and using the technologies and the internet and globalization uh, to have their own smaller lives. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how you can tell what the answer to that is. Please discuss Mr. Hyder. Uh, with respect to other nations than Austria? Like one of the reasons, and again, this is for a European to talk to you about, but I believe that one of the reasons that the European Union acted so strongly or reacted so strongly to the possibility of Haider himself getting into government and then his party getting into government was, was exactly to send the signal to those kinds of parties and groups in other countries in the European Union that the European Union is also not just a group of people who buy and sell and trade things, but also a group of people with values. So I believe that what you saw after uh, the collapse of the, that Austrian government and the reformation of the coalition well, was a signal to all others that this would be taken very, very seriously by the European Union. Would, would you define democratic values as modified by the Haider experience? Well, sure. I, 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 I think that, you know, no question. I mean, Haider got elected. Haider's the governor of a big state in Austria. Um, but democratic values uh, have to do with how you operate in this world and how you treat people in your own country and how you talk about people in other countries. And, you know, there's no question that Austria is a real democracy. Uh, there's also no question that uh, they've got to understand, from our perspective anyway, from the American perspective, what a threat it is to a democratic system if somebody like that is left unchecked and left unspoken about. Our position on Haider uh, and his government was slightly different than that than the European Union. Remember the European Union said, we're cutting off all our bilateral relations with Austria. Well, if you're in the European Union, that's one way to look at it, but you still have all the relationships with Austria um, through the European Union. What Secretary Albright decided to do, and I think very, very successfully, was to work on the change Chancellor Schussel, who is not obviously a member of Haider's party, and urged him to negotiate what are called the precepts of that government. 
and then stick to them. And our policy has been that we want to see the Austrian government live up to the precepts that it signed for itself. And those precepts are based on democratic values, issues of tolerance, and very importantly for us, rapid, rapid progress on issues like Holocaust assets and slave labor. Is it, is it proper to grant self-determination to ethnic Albanians and not to Mexicans in Southern California if they ask for it? Well, I, I recognize that I'm from Washington, D.C., so what I'm about to say you may or may not take uh, one way or the other, but Washington, D.C. is not Slobodan Milosevic. There's nobody in Washington, D.C. who is pursuing a policy in Southern California that Slobodan Milosevic was pursuing in Kosovo. And, uh, that seems to me the answer to this question. I, I mean, you could go off on this philosophically and talk about it for a long time, but uh, what happened in Kosovo was outrageous. It was, a con was an affront to these kinds of democratic values, uh, and NATO acted. Now, NATO did not act to create an independent Kosovo. What NATO did, though, was act to protect a lot of people who I think were in very, very grave danger, uh, and what happened during that war and afterwards is proof of it. Given your several comments about uh, democracy, the European uh, military force being strengthened, referring back to the uh, original purpose and nature of NATO, how would you project its, uh, what would you think it look, will look like uh, down the road? All I can hope is that 50 years from now, NATO will have been as successful, as I said, dealing with some of the new threats that are coming as it was for the past 50 years dealing with the old threats. And the reason I say that is, twofold. One, I think it's very, very important, and we've talked a lot about democracy and what kind of values we have, but it's very important to understand that the fundamental purpose of NATO, Article 5, come to somebody else's defense if they are attacked, still remains the fundamental purpose of NATO. Nobody has changed that. Nobody wants to change that. But what we see coming in the years ahead are new kinds of threats. For example, weapons of mass destruction, biological weapons, chemical weapons, nuclear weapons that can be delivered by emerging states that are threats to us. Uh, ethnic conflict, like Kosovo, has clearly created instability. And I think there are going to be times when NATO is going to have to decide whether it wants to act in these areas. And what we did in April of 1999 at the NATO summit was reinforce the fundamental principle of NATO, Article 5, but also say, but there are some new threats out there, and NATO needs a new strategic concept. It needs a new way to think about coming threats. The reason, as you very rightly say, that European, European defense is so important in this is that I think, actually, there are going to be times when NATO is not going to want to act because it's a transatlantic alliance. It's about Article 5, Article 4. And there are going to be other times when NATO is not going to become want to be involved. And so one of the reasons that we have supported the European security and defense identity is so on those occasions where NATO doesn't want to be involved, and the phrase we use is where the alliance as a whole is not engaged, that there is European capacity to do something in or around Europe. So I would hope that, I don't know if I can look out 50 years, but I would hope over the next few years that NATO will keep its fundamental principles, will be ready to do what it has to do in terms of Article 5 will have changed and be ready also to deal in crisis management, but also will have helped the Europeans create their own capacity to act where the alliance is not engaged. But you have not mentioned at all the United Nations, and how does NATO interface with that? The additional question is how does, the, uh, uh, how does NATO interface with the UN? Well, the NATO interfaces with the United Nations in different ways in different <coughs> circumstances. NATO interfaced with the United Nations in a certain way uh, during Bosnia, when uh, the United Nations was part of the effort in Bosnia, and NATO came in first as in the, in the uh, I-4 and then S-4. Um, NATO has rela related to the United Nations now in Kosovo in a very important way, because don't forget it's the United Nations through Bernard Kushner, who is essentially running the international effort in Kosovo, and NATO is part of that. Um, the issue that always comes up for us is would you, and this is a question you all have to ask yourselves, I know what my answer is, do you have to have a UN Security Council resolution for NATO to act? And our answer to that is no, that there are going to be times when NATO has to act without a Security Council resolution, and Kosovo was one of those times. Now, we think a UN Security Council resolution is always desirable, but isn't always necessary. And 
that's where the issue between the United States and, and NATO, and the United States and some of our European allies comes out. But our view is clear. Our view is there will be times in this world when NATO should be able to act without the benefit of a Security Council resolution. Why, uh, why intervention in Kosovo and not in other parts of the world, such as former European colonies? Well, obviously, I mean, we, we are in a conversation with our European allies about their former colonies. Uh, they, I think, lead in, in these areas. Um, you know, one of the hard things about making these kinds of choices, and one of the differences between observing international affairs and participating in international affairs, is you come down to these cases of why Kosovo and not Rwanda. But I think, you know, I think uh, Secretary General Anan has spoken very eloquently about the failure of the international community in Rwanda, and people have to remember that. Now, in Kosovo, you know, Kosovo has got a couple of things. One is, is it's close to NATO, which is a very important thing. And although, you know, yes, there are, there are terrible other things that happen in this world, you know, being close to instability in NATO is a very important thing for United States foreign policy. I mean, agree or disagree, it's, it's a very important indicator for us. The other thing is, and, and again, maybe this will sound too practical to you, but it is kind of my responsibility. The other thing about Kosovo is, is we were able to do something there. We had NATO allies in, in the region. We flew missions out of Italy, and we flew missions out of Turkey. We were able to bring the force to bear in that area in a way that perhaps we weren't some other place. Now, I don't, I, I don't deal with the moral argument here, and you can fault me for that. Um, but my issue here is, is that one of the reasons that you all have to give us credit for is um, that there's a practical argument here. And part of our ability to act in Kosovo was our ability to act in Kosovo. Would you uh, comment upon, upon uh, economics and the questions of stability? It's interesting to me, actually, as I give these talks around, that um, although we do our best, or I did my best and clearly didn't do a very good job, of emphasizing the economic relationships in all of these things and talking about the five indicators about what a future U.S.-European relationship would be about, three of them about economics, people in the end really want to talk about NATO and want to talk about security and want to talk about Kosovo, and fair enough. But I think you put your finger on a very important point. Don't forget, what I said were our three themes for this future of this relationship were security, prosperity, and democracy. And I believe that we're, the days are over when you could spend kind of Monday and Tuesday working on security issues, Wednesday and Thursday working on your economy, and Friday and Saturday working on democracy. We live in a simultaneous world. And the success of countries, or failure of countries, is going to be their ability to deal with all three of these things simultaneously. So I, I was trying to answer the question about what I think NATO would look like in, in, in some years in the future. But I, I hope that you will have taken from this presentation that if we don't get the economics of this right, and if we don't get the democracy part of this right, it won't succeed. This isn't any longer one-third, one-third, one-third. It's a whole. Would you uh, comment upon the possibility <laughs> of religious insensitivity creeping into NATO's policies? It's, I actually can't have come to exactly the opposite conclusion about Sam Huntington. And when Sam Huntington published his book, I, I think I was living in Turkey the first time that we served there. And I thought, this is a blinding insight. And we really are going to go to war here on religion. And I have to say that, and I'd love to talk to you about it some more, but I, I have to say that over the years, I've actually come to the opposite conclusion, which is that although it is something very, very worth watching out for, that those divisions are not the divisions in the end that will bring conflict. Now, when I answer that question, I do not in any way, shape, or form sort of underestimate all the points that you, that you make. You make very, very important points. But I go back to this issue of the Lexus and the olive tree. And I go back to the issue of what is happening in globalization. And in a funny way, I think that Friedman is the answer to Sam Huntington if we'll allow it to be. Now, it doesn't mean that globalization is perfect. Um, and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't pay close attention, those of you who read this, to traditional values in the olive tree. But I think that if we fall into this trap of saying that this division exists so it must always exist, that we don't do ourselves any favors. Now, let me make three points. One is, is that I, I think the issue of religious insensitivity, as the moderator has put it, 
is a really important one. And one of the things that we have to do uh, as professionals in this area, uh, and as I think as people generally, we have to listen more carefully to what people's concerns are all about. Fair enough. And I think one of the things that uh, the department has done by having a religious affairs coordinator now has tried to help in that regard. Second, uh, I do think we have to pay attention to trying to right those wrongs and, and, and make progress where we can. And here, one of the reasons that I said that we spend a tremendous amount of time uh, working in the Eastern Mediterranean is is because I think what is happening now between Greece and Turkey is a very, very positive development. And I give all credit here to you know, Prime Minister Samides and uh, the Turkish leadership, to Foreign Minister Papandreou, to Foreign Minister Jem. But those are the kinds of things that we need to continue. And we should continue them uh, not because we're worried that there's a big distinction here in their religion. We should continue them because these both modern societies need to get on with one another. You mentioned Cyprus. Um, there again, I think one of the most important things that we can do in this year uh, is see if we can't hurry up, my, I guess the undiplomatic way to put it, uh, with the negotiations that have been begun on Cyprus. I mean, nothing much happened there for a long number of years. But last year in December, again in March, and starting again on the 23rd of May, we've really started now this conversation between Cypriots uh, going again very much under the auspices of the United Nations. So, I don't say that this is a perfect answer to your question, but I've actually come after all these years to come at it from a, di from a different angle. And Huntington got it. We ought to pay attention to this. But I actually don't think it defines our world. Why hasn't the United States moved its embassy to Jerusalem? I think the answer to that question is because the United States believes that it would be part of uh, the, a, 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 uh, a comprehensive uh, settlement there that we haven't yet achieved. We've, uh, we've witnessed an enormous example of, of energy and perseverance. Uh, <laughs> and it's been extraordinarily uh, interesting. Uh, we're better informed for this evening. Uh, and it's been very entertaining and enjoyable. We thank you enormously. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob.